Welcome everyone. We're, we're just going to give that a moment and let everybody get in to this incredible panel. Sorry for the late start. Do I enter? Can I? Yep. Um, Thank you everyone for being oh, here today. Sorry, Zara. It's okay, I'm gonna go. Oh, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we just let everyone get in and then I'll kick it off. Okay, let's get started again. Um, as usual, apologies if you've heard this introduction, but for those people that are joining for the first time, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us again. Um, my name is Shannon Ganem, and I'm the Global Education Director at Magnum Photos. And with my colleague, Pauline Vermeer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New York, we are your hosts for the Beyond Magnum series. Beyond Magnum is an in-depth talks program created to explore some of the challenges facing our agency and our industry today. Through this series of free talks and chapters addressing archives, representation, and the future of photography, speakers will share thoughts and engage in debate across a range of issues. Each section will be led by respected figures from the world of photography, and speakers will range from practitioners to academics to subjects of photographs. Recordings from chapter one and chapter two can be found on the Beyond Magnum page and on the Magnum Photos YouTube channel. And you can hear more from our president, Olivia Arthur, about the aims of the program in the first session. So a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off our next session. Today's event is being hosted via Zoom webinar. So please put any questions that you might have for our speakers in the Q&A box uh, or the chat, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. We recognize that this series of events will likely raise more questions and answer them, and that it is the beginning of a conversation. So we thank you for your contributions to that dialogue. You'll be seeing more from us following the program about how we plan to take that dialogue forward for us as an agency and as part of a wider industry. Uh, and so with that, I will hand over to Pauline to introduce our chapter co-chair, Zara Rasool, um, and invite Zara uh, to switch on her camera and mic. Thanks, Tiba. Thank you, Shannon, and welcome, everybody. We are very um, excited for this talk and very grateful to you, Zara, and to Frederick and for co-hosting this chapter on the future of photography. Um, everyone, I'll make it short because there's so much to be discussed now. I just want you to know that Zara's impressive bio is on the, the Beyond Magnum webpage if you want to look at it uh, to have more information. Also, she spoke yesterday, Zara and Fred were in conversation yesterday and it was an illuminating conversation. So with no further ado, I'm going to leave Zara to introduce all her guests today. And to you all, I uh, want to express my gratitude um, for, for being here and I look forward to hearing you all. So over to you, Zara. Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, thank you for being here today. And we're so excited to talk about the impact of social media. It's something that we deal with on a, on, on a daily basis. And we've divided this panel into two parts. The first part is we're going to look at the impact of social media images and videos on the COVID crisis and on Gaza. And then the second, second part of the panel is going to deal with the climate crisis. We're hoping we'll be able to do 45 minutes of COVID in Gaza and then the, the, the next 45 minutes uh, talking about the climate crisis. For the first part of our panel, we have uh, two lovely guests and I'm going to read you their bios. Uh, the first is Samar Abu Alouf, and uh, she is a Palestinian photographer residing in the Gaza Strip. Her work is primarily focused in Gaza, given the issues that stem from her personal experiences with gender, women, and children, and the consequences of war. As of 2010, she has been working as an independent photographer, assigned duties by Reuters and others. Abu Alouf's main focus was on her ongoing projects on the life of women in Gaza. Uh, she is going to be joined by Akram, who will be translating whatever she tells us into English. Samar will be talking in Arabic and Akram will be doing the translating. Uh, the next panelist we have is Joshua Irwandi from Jakarta, Indonesia, and he is a freelance documentary photographer and a National Geographic explorer based in Jakarta. 
Irwandi received a BA in English Literature from the University of Exeter and pursued graduate studies in photojournalism and documentary photography at the London College of Communication. While working in West Papua, Indonesia, Irwandi was embedded as a museum staff at the Asmat Museum and focused on a long-term project on the changes in identity and landscape of the Asmat people. His project, Not a Blank Canvas, has been awarded the National Geographic Society Storytelling Grant in 2021. Irwandi's work is part of the Forhana Foundation Fund for Young Talent Grant and National Geographic Society's COVID-19 Emergency Fund for Journalists Project. One of his images, The Human Cost of COVID-19, sparked controversy in Indonesia when it went viral after publication by National Geographic. In 2021, he was selected as one of the speakers for National Geographic Society's Storyteller, Storyteller Summit. Recently, he was awarded the 2021 World Press Photo Award in General News and selected as a finalist of the Pulitzer Prizes in Breaking News Photography. Irwandi's work has been featured in National Geographic, The Times of London, CNN, Time, and The Guardian. Uh, Joshua and Samar and Akram, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, let's get straight to it. Um, Joshua, if you want to go first with your presentation, we'll hear from you, from you and about your work. Hello, thank you so much, Zara, for, 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 the, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to um, quickly share my screen here. All right. Um, my name is Joshua Irwandi. Um, thank you again for the introduction there, uh, Zara. I'm a 29-year-old documentary photographer coming to you from Jakarta, Indonesia, the current epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in Southeast Asia. It is an honor to be part of the Beyond Magnum Talk series today. This is my story. Last year, National Geographic magazine published my image to the feature, How Pandemics Change Us. It was the photograph of a suspected COVID-19 victim in a hospital in Indonesia on the patient's deathbed wait, waiting a body bag. As mandated by the Indonesian Ministry of Health, the wrapping of the body is a standard procedure for every suspected, comorbid, and positive confirmed COVID-19 deaths. As is the case with most victims, family members were not allowed to say goodbye. This image was part of my reportage on the doctors and nurses at a COVID-19 hospital ward in Indonesia. I wanted to show the work of the medical force fighting the pandemic. Early on, I organized food donations for the medical workers. I gained the trust of the doctors and nurses and witnessed the nature of their work. The reality for most doctors and nurses, families of patients and victims, and myself, as a photojournalist that was allowed access to the hospital was vastly different to what the public might be seeing on a daily basis. As chaos unrolled, the government played down the seriousness of the spread of the virus. We simply decided to wake up late to the pandemic, the greatest medical crisis in modern Indonesian history. Ahead of my coverage, I was well aware of the ethical dilemma in doing work of this nature. However, I was met with heavy challenge when this photograph was about to be published by National Geographic. The hospital was reluctant to release the image, fearing its outcome from the government and the public. I consulted veteran photojournalists like uh, Geert van Kesteren, who used to be at Magnum, as well as, academic, as well as academics for opinion, and they supported my case. Media lawyers ensured the publication was legal. Eventually, the picture was allowed to be published with total anonymity. The story came out, but it was when I republished the image on my personal Instagram that the photos sparked violent reactions. I wanted to highlight the human cost of coronavirus. I wanted people to know what the consequences might be if we ignore the health protocols. I wanted people to know what the reality was after months and months of the statistics and adaptation 
to the so-called new normal, everyone needed to know. But in an unforeseen turn of events, I became number one trending topic in Indonesia. Celebrities and government officials doubted the legitimacy of the image. I was accused of setting up the photo to spread fear. Many thought I brought studio lights to photograph the body. Many thought it was a mannequin inside. I was called a slave of WHO, slave of Disney, agents of the Jews. They say media is the virus. Or if the photographer is still alive after two weeks, this is all pure business. Details of my private life were released as news. I received violence, direct messages, racial abuse, and comments across all social media. An Indonesian singer with over 2 million followers here questioned the image. He said that because my post was being shared by accounts with big followers, he suspected this image, this propaganda, must have been planned. He questioned why were families not allowed to see their loved ones while a photographer was able to. He also said on Instagram post on an Instagram post that quote unquote COVID exists, but it's not that scary. The Indonesian COVID-19 task force spokesperson claimed that myself and the people who shared the image as being unethical, even though one of the members of his own task force team with 1.7 million followers sent me a direct message on Instagram asking for my permission to repost the image on her Instagram story. Eventually, the Indonesian government tried to hunt down and identify the hospital where the photograph was made. And, and consequentially, to protect the hospital and all the sources, the rest of my images and stories from the COVID war may never be published. To weather the storm, I requested National Geographic to re-verify the image through an Instagram post. Within 21 hours, the post received over a million likes. National Geographic offered security personnel to protect my house for 24 hours, seven days a week. The Committee for the Protection of Journalists also offered to make a statement. I had to refuse, so as not to add fuel to the fire. The Indonesian Photojournalists Association stepped up. The association demanded publicly for the singer to apologize and take the post down. Uh, Bea Wiharta, a senior former Reuters photojournalist, led three public webinars in a row defending the work, saying that the work of a photojournalist cannot be equated with the work of an influencer. As a result of this viral activity throughout Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, my initial post received over 355,000 likes and has been shared 142,000 times on, an, on Instagram story and saved 30,000 times as this post insights show. My followers on Instagram went from 1,300 to 37.8 thousand in the space of two weeks. There were over 500 news outlets who used the image without permission out of 500, only five publications ever paid for the use of the image. In the midst of this all, up until today, there has been 1,027 medical workers in Indonesia who have died from the pandemic. The highest mortality rate of medical workers due to COVID-19 in Southeast Asia in a country with one doctor in every 10,000 population. Now, 
where are the influencers and the policymakers who ridiculed visual journalists when today the country's medical system breaks down? Members of my own family who are part of the medical force now, goes, now go to the emergency room daily witnessing people queuing up to get a room, a treatment, as they hear others in the same room wailing in tears as they mourn the passing of their loved ones, unable to get medical attention. Can we hold them accountable for tainting information that were served to inform and warn about the dangers of the virus? All of us are paying the price now. This phenomenon is the basis of my project Viral. One image and a myriad of polarized reactions as coined by Claudine Bouglon, who once worked also um, on Magnum in Motion. The project Viral examines the DNA of a viral image in a post-truth landscape. We are at a point in time in history where the position of journalism as the watchdog of democracy is under grave threat. Social media is now the most substantive and effective means to bring our message. They have become indispensable. Yet we lose control of ownership. Our words and images are constantly stolen, distorted, defamed, decontextualized. It came almost as no surprise that my image was used both as an example for those who believe and don't believe in COVID-19. We come upon a worrying fact that the only version of reality people choose to believe in is the reality they curate for themselves, an echo chamber with no exit door. We hope to be a storyteller recording history as it unfolds. Yet, how do we create narratives that best communicate realities? Who are we making pictures for? Who are really seeing our work and how are they seeing it? How does our work st stand the stream of information and disinformation set out by algorithm? Above all this, how much how much authorship, moderation, and ethics can be negotiated? What visual history can we reference to in 10, 20 years into the future? And how do we restore people's faith in journalism? These are the questions and ponderings Viral hope to address. Susan Mizellas once said, an event doesn't exist in our world unless one of us happens to be there. While people say photojournalism is dead, as a matter of fact, responsible visual journalism is one of our, is one of our most reliable sources of information during the pandemic. Our economic models, perceptions and representations may change, but it doesn't change one of the most basic tenets of photojournalism, we need someone to be there to see and record it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joshua, for that really wonderful presentation. And to everybody listening in, please feel free to send us your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the panelists finish their presentation to send us questions. Please keep them coming so that I can make sure that they get to the panelists as soon as they finish their uh, finish talking. Uh, we'll move on to Summer now. Uh, Summer, if you could turn on your video and your microphone. And Joshua, I'm, asking, I'm gonna ask you to turn off your video and mute yourself, please. Hello. Can you see Samar? Yes, we can see you, Akram. Now, can you see Samar? Yes, we can see Samar now. Okay. Yeah. Samar, whenever you're ready to start. 
في البداية But before this uh, group of people and from the journalists and students, I'm extremely uh, happy to get you here. Akram, sorry, Akram, just a minute. Yes. Uh, we are hearing both your voices together, so we're not able to. Hear okay, how is it now? So if maybe summer talks, then you translate it will be easier. Okay, but that will take 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. Uh, okay, so maybe then, um, because we're hearing both the voices come together. Okay. But okay, I think so I think maybe both mics were on. Maybe if we try with my picture, right? just with your Akram, just your mic on. Perhaps. Okay. How is it now? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. We we're starting again. Okay. Okay. And maybe if you're if you're very close together, it may still be a problem. But okay, we are um, distancing now and let's see how it uh, okay. Let's Thank try you. now, let's give a try. Okay. It's still the same, right? Yeah, it's still the okay. same. I will do that consecutively, okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. At the outset, I thank Magnum that gave me that space to speak from the heart of the Gaza city in front of this great uh, crowd from the photograph, photojournalist and attendants. I'm extremely thirsty that you hear me and to explain more how I, how I cried and how I laughed and how, how I ran for 11 days from photography. I'm not going to speak about my suffering but neither about my attempt, but I'm going to speak about my, I, my attempts to educate myself and to teach myself about my attempts to become what I am, to make it to the goal that I want to achieve for things that I thought was long fetched. And here it is today happening despite all the heartaches, despite all the trembling that I have been through, uh, that now after I have succeeded, everything that I have suffered and I have seen in my in my career seems to be insignificant after achieving that uh, success. I have been facing the uh, different and challenging norms and traditions of my community, the masculine community that never accepted me at the beginning of my work, which made me even more insisting on continuing to communicate the image where I was in many times the only photographer. I was standing all by myself in the world of young male a uh, photographer اوصف الصور التي اراها بعيني اوثقها بروحي وقلبي تصل الى العالم في ظل ضغوط رهيبه من قطاع الكهرباء واغلاق المعابر ونقص المعدات وغلائها كمصوره تحلم دائما بتطوير نفسها والرقي لتحسين الاداء والاستمرار مع ضغوط اكثر صعوبه كام لاربعه اطفال مسؤول عنهم مسؤوليه تامه في كل احتياجاتهم ورغم ذلك أقاتل لأكون وأعمل كل ما في وسعي لإيصال الصورة والحقيقة وأدرب نفسي في ظل كل فرص التدريب المعدومة تقريبا أستعين بالتغذية البصرية رغم شعوري بالقصور الدائم أنني لم أشبع من التعلم في مجال تصوير القصة بالطريقة التي يجب أن تكون لم أسمح لأي عقبة لأن تبقى في طريقي للاستمرار رغم التحديات التي أحاول تخطيها باستمرار من تصوير الحروب لقد غطيت ثلاثة حروب إضافة للأحداث اليومية والمسيرات على طول الشريط الحدودي لقطاع غزة ونقلت صور الأمل والتحدي وقصص النساء الملهمات I've been documenting the photos that I've been seeing with my own eyes I have been documenting them with my soul and spirit and with my heart to make it to the world under uh, the enormous pressures, including electricity outages, closure of crossings, and the shortage of equipment and the high cost of, of equipment for a me female photographer who's dreaming always of development and of improvement to improve the performance and to continue the work and sustain it with uh, more difficult pressures 
for me as a mother of four children who is fully responsible or responsible about all their needs and paying the rental of the house. And despite that all, I kept fighting to become what I wanted to become. And I also could have done all I can do uh, to seek to deliver the true image and the truth about the situation and also train myself under the very scarce training opportunities that are almost existent. I have been using the visual feedback and feeding despite my feeling of shortage and lacking feeling, constant lacking because I have never been full from educating in the field of photography and storytelling and photography in the way that it should be. I have never allowed an obstacle to stop me from continuing my way to the future despite all the challenges and against all the odds I have that I have been always overcoming, uh, starting from uh, photography and the war where I covered three consecutive wars. I covered all the daily events and the marshes through, uh, alongside the, uh, the border in the Gaza Strip. I also communicated and published the images of the hope, images of the challenge and the stories of the inspiring women. Now I'm going to speak about the photos. I'm going to take you through my uh, different photos. If you may go back to uh, photo number one. This is a photo of bombardment that I took it myself. Photo number two. That was a shock for me when I was doing photography because they were targeting residential apartments when the people were still there and the children were extremely terrified because of that. The third photo, please. The one person that you see dead in the photo is one of my relatives. I was taking the photo and at the very same time, I was crying over the death of him and my relative. The, uh, the second, the next photo, please. And the, the, the residential tower, the tower that you see in the photo is Al Jala Tower, where that used to house uh, the AP and many other uh, foreign uh, news outlets and media outlets. And I had very uh, delicate memories from that place where I used to take photos and footage from the Gaza Strip being bombardment at the times of war. So when I was taking the photo of that uh, tower being targeted and noise, where I was somehow around that tower, I had that very strange feeling seeing as if the memories were falling apart when that uh, tower was being targeted. <laughs> this, uh, the next photo, please. <laughs> and the one after. Those are photos of the streets that the bombardment of which was extremely terrifying because they were bombardment, bombarded by the F-35 war jets in the middle of the residential neighborhoods. The next photo. Those are the civil defense men who were trying to fetch uh, victims from Abu Lawf family. And by the way, Abu Lawf family is my, my, my family. And the bombardment was few steps away from me. The photo after that, the next photo, please. That's uh, and the one you see injured in the photo is Omar. His father is a doctor who was the head of the Corona department in the Shifa Medical Complex. He is uh, the doctor himself and the whole family was killed in one bombardment. And out of the five family members, Omar is the only survivor. Next photo, please. And then next photo. That's me and the photo in a, in a state of shock because there were many people under the, uh, under the rubble. I live the sound of the explosion because I live uh, nearby. 
And when I was there and I rushed there to take photo, I was extremely shocked because of the footage and because of the fact that many of the people who were under the rubble are from my relatives. Uh, now the video, please. One second. I, okay. Uh, one second. Okay. Okay, to provide an introduction about this while you are trying to get it uh, work, uh, this video is of me after receiving a phone call from my daughter. Uh, she was telling me that our house was targeted by a missile and they all rushed outside home without me being with them after they evacuated our home. And then I walked a bit uh, to make sure that I can be there for them, but then I was tired and then I sat down and then this video was taken when I was sitting down and I was trying to make it to them and fetch them from that place. And it turns out that it was, is the video on now? No, not yet. Okay. And then it turned out that our home was hit by a missile shrapnel. And I'll play the video. Yes, play the video, please. And then when this video was taken, I was sleep deprived from several days because of this coverage of the war event. Sorry, we can't, we can't hear you because of the sound of the video. Okay, now play the video and we will say the, uh, whatever she wants to say after you see Okay, the thank you. So this video was taken after I was sleep deprived for a few days because I was doing some coverage for the uh, on uh, the war coverage. Now we we'll go back to the photos, please. The, uh, to the next photo, I asked that what you see is in, in my incubator. That, that photo is from my home and what you see and the, the, the hole that you see in the ceiling is because of the sharp, shrapnel you see on the other in, uh, the other half of the of the photo, and it was a shrapnel, a missile shrapnel that made that hole in my home. Uh, next photo, please. This is the pot that I more of an utensil that I was putting on my head on the board when I was doing coverage for the uh, border marshes, and that I did that as a visibility and for safety. And that camera you see next to the pot is the camera that was broken by the people who attacked me and broke my camera in 2014 uh, war. Next photo, please. As you can see, that was I was putting on for visibility a nylon uh, back and the pot. Next photo. At least so that the soldiers who are next, who are watching the, the borderline might understand that I am, uh, I am a journalist or a photojournalist and they won't target me. Next two photos, please. You see in the photo, you see the people uh, in the back, they look, uh, they look surprised and amazed by that I am a woman and I'm doing that type of thing. Next photo, please. That's, sure. That is the photo of me uh, when I was putting, uh, was taking some photos of the activities by the, uh, the border. Next one. How I am, uh, okay. Mumkin khalas the presentation. And oh, that's no. the, the photo that you saw there that I was the only one among all the men. Next photo, please. Hi, Phil Corona. That's during the Corona time in the Gaza Strip. Women? 
uh, during the corona COVID and they, and the nurses, despite the uh, seriousness of this coronavirus, how they were uh, how they were struggling to do. And the last photo, please. Uh, and then this photo shows that the life goes on against all the odds. And the last photo, please. Last one is a photo of a missile. You can see the missile landing and sleeping on the and the bit almost a one ton. Uh, missile that landed in a home and that photo caused a, like a great reaction uh, when it was published. Thank you very much. And sorry for just the long interpretation and talking. Samar and Joshua, thank you so much. Samar, thank your presentation. I mean, we could continue to hear from you and learn from you and see the incredible work that you're doing. Uh, but I do want to leave some time for questions so that we can actually have a conversation. Joshua, if you can turn on your video and unmute yourself, I'll bring you into the conversation now. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, that both of your works or both the work that you guys are doing is so important, so urgent, and you know there is so much to talk about. Uh, before I get into my first question, panel uh, people who are attending, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box. I'd love to get them to Joshua and Summer. Summer, you can turn on your video as well so we can see you. Joshua, I'm gonna start uh, with you. Um, you know, the picture that you published about the person wrapped in the, in the plastic bag, that went viral, it had an impact probably you didn't imagine before you published it. Um, can you explain to us what does that virality, sort of something going viral on social media, how does that, impact you as a photographer and impact you as a person? Um, that, is, that is actually very true, uh, uh, Zara, that I never expected the image um, to, to go viral at all. I mean, to be honest, I never, ex I never expected the image to be, to be published. It was just a part of you know, a reportage that I sent to National Geographic for the editors to look and then, well, this is the situation in Indonesia. But you know, I never imagined. Again, I posted the image on Instagram as 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 soon as National Geographic made it live um, on their website, and you know, it just it just kind of snowballed, and 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 people were um, using it. You know, like well, this is uh, the this this is the, the the reality, and and people were posting it on Insta Story as 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 you can already see then, um, and. I think it, you know, at the, at the at the beginning, it was it was you know people were just kind of to realize, well, this is the this is the reality. But then, like when the the, the COVID deniers kicked in, that's like I think when, um, you know, people started to you know attack the image, um, start, start started started to, to attack the image, um, and I, I think I think that that changed the the tone of the. Of, of the uh, of the of the conversation of, of the image entirely mm -hmm. I think the the impact um, for me um, well obviously uh, we, we, we were um, pretty we, we were quite traumatized by what happened and and I think I, I, I can safely assume that you know I, I won't have you know I don't I won't have any kind of you know personal life presence on my social media like I so I can't really publish you know um, images of my family or friends because I think you know this is may this may just me this may just be me being paranoid but I think we are often becoming targets we are being we as for journalists we are we, we are we are targets now like we've seen with Samar and how people break her camera we've seen like Erin Schaaf in New York um, when when um, when she when she was covering the riot in the Capitol Hill um, so yeah, um, yeah, and just you know, just just adding on to that, Joshua, I, I loved you brought in this idea of authorship and moderation, and how those are things that, in the age of social media, have become very difficult. You know, we are fairly young. We do remember a time where life we lived outside of the social platforms, but much of our lives, I could say have happened on social platforms. You know, previously you had to wait for an editor to have your picture picked and then published. And you know, you, you got famous or you got known because of being published in an esteemed magazine. Now you can essentially just take your photograph when you filmed it the next day or the same day, upload it on Instagram and it can blow up immediately, correct? And how, how does that, that idea of you being 
you having that control to publish your own photograph change the authorship and the moderation that you have on your work? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think as, as authorship goes, um, I come to realize that in, within the architecture of social media on itself, um, the, the, the idea of, of copyright or authorship, that's, that's completely dismissed. As long as we sign up to Instagram or Facebook, whatever we are producing that, you know, as, as, far, as, the regul as far as the regulations are concerned, um, we, don't, we no longer own those images. And that's, I think that's, that, that's what happens when, um, when, when my, my images are being stolen or being, you know, being, you know like you can, you, you, can, you can just screenshot it and, and put it on, on whatever um, publication. Um, you know that they that they want. And are there any though? Are there any positive effects of having control over your your publishing of your work that you've seen? Um. Positive, yeah. Positive effects of uh, of of having control. I mean, okay. Well, I'll be honest. I mean, I use social media in a way that you know. Sometimes, if National Geographic publish something, then I kind of you know. Uh, put that up on social media just to amplify and and and, and to to reach out to the to, to my audience to, to my follow audience whoever the readers um and I, th I think that's and that's that's one positive side of it you know like you can reach the audience faster and like i said like you know um, i think this is the age where we are so indispensable when where social media is so indispensable um and that is uh, and, and and that is a good thing, but also on the flip side, we can also see like how 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 social media can and our image, our content, if we put on social media, how can how they can be, um, you know, distorted in 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 so many various ways. Okay, Summer, we have questions for you as well, and there's a panelist who asks you, "Hi, Summer, what motivates you to record conflict and tragedy whilst you're experiencing it?" What impact do you want it to have? And this is from Zoe. Thank you, Zoe, for the question. Uh, number one, I am the one who's living in this very particular place, and I am the one who most feels for the people living in that place. And my conviction is no matter how expressive and strong the photo is, it will still be lacking because it will fail to express the depth and the profound, the depth of the crisis that we are living in the Gaza Strip. And I always try to show the stories of hope uh, and life for the children and women because they aspire to live despite uh, and against all the odds. What I hope is that those photos, once they're getting viral, they can bring about justice for the people in Palestine and the people who are living in Gaza. That's it. Thank you, Samar. Uh, and Zoe has a question for you as well, Joshua. She asks, what you said about your photo being used as evidence for both sides is really interesting. Do you feel responsible for how your images are interpreted after you publish them? It's, wow, well, it, it's a very good question. Um, do I feel, I suppose would be, would be, would be my answer. Um, I, I mean, as far as responsibility is concerned, I, I, I published my, my own caption um, on that particular Instagram post. And I think, I think on that caption, I stated pretty uh, quite clearly what I intend to do with, you know, why, I, why I'm showing this image, what this image is about and, and you know, what it means. But in terms of responsibility, I think we as photographers um, at, at the moment, at the current moment, I don't think we, necessarily have any means to kind of protect the to maintain the integrity of our work i think we'll, you know like there's there's no way that 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 uh, we we can kind of control how people are, are are using it it's 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 kind of entirely out of our hands i mean like there's something like adobe 
Adobe's um, Content Auth Authenticity Initiative um, that Fred Richard actually in introduced to me. It was an in initiative at, by Adobe, um, quite ironically. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the people who initiated is, uh, is Santiago Lyon, who used to work as at, at Associated Press. So on CAI, you can actually, you know, go, you go on an image and, you, and then you, you check like how authentic or how tr truthful or how trustful um, the, that image is. But even then that is a slippery slope because, it, you know, like how do you, how, you know, how do you maintain trust in, in photojournalism? How do you, um, you know, like it, does, it doesn't stop, um, for, it doesn't stop um, people from, you know, distorting and, and reusing it in whatever ways they want. So I think, yeah, in that sense, our responsibilities, uh, we, we certainly have to take care of them and we don't have all the structures and for, and, um, for it, but, you know, and we, we are limited by these means. Absolutely. Um, that is, uh, it's a very complex issue and it's something that we're trying to, it's evolving and we're trying to figure out answers as uh, we continue in the practice. Summer, I have, uh, you know, I have a final question for you and then I'll ask you both last thoughts. But Summer, for you, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you're working in a conflict zone, you're working, you know, on an issue about Palestinian rights, fighting for Palestinian rights, which I can speak from an American context. You know, people are a lot more empathetic about what's happening in Palestine, but there are still a lot of people, especially on social media, who are uh, who who don't stand for it and are vicious about attacking people who are working towards the Palestinian cause. How do you deal with that kind of harassment? How do you deal with maybe harassment or negative comments that come from men who see you out in the field, who are doing the work where we don't see a lot of women doing what you're doing? اه تمام قول بحاول انه الصور حقيقيه اللي بتوصل للناس انه هي هي تعبر عن حجم الماساه فيعني قد ما بدهم يحكوا قد ما بدهم يحاولوا انه ينكروا الحقيقه والامر الواقع اللي موجود بالصوره يعني او او الفيديو اللي بيوصل للناس هذول من خلال وسائل التواصل هو اكبر دليل على اللي بيصير في غزه فأنا أحياناً بعذرهم لأنهم هم مش موجودين أصلاً في غزة مش عارفين إيش اللي بيصير بالضبط كثير في ناس لما بيجوا على غزة وبيشوفوا الإشي على أرض الواقع وبيسمعوا الرواية من مكان الحقيقي بيغيروا نظرتهم على الأقل يعني بيصيروا حياديين أكثر. So the 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 thing that I have been trying to do all the time is to make sure that the photo that I am taking is expressing the whole situation and it is strong enough to provide an account of the things that are happening in the Gaza Strip. Sometimes I understand why some people would attack me and why some people wouldn't understand the real situation in the Gaza Strip because they have never been to the Gaza Strip. Some of the people who visited the Gaza Strip have changed their perception of the people of Gaza Strip and their perception of the reality in the Gaza Strip and have changed their way of expressing, expressing things about the Gaza Strip. So I'm trying to do uh, what I'm trying to do is to provide as expressive and powerful photos to make sure people understand and relate to the situation in Gaza Strip. And to the ones who don't understand the situation in Gaza Strip, I understand the, the fact that they don't understand and I try as much as I can to help them understand through the photos that I'm providing to them. Thank you so much for your answers. Joshua, thank you so much for participating. Are there any final thoughts you would like to share with the panelists? We have a lot of comments coming in the chats, but unfortunately we're not able to get uh, across to you Zahra, guys. Zahra? Yes. Yeah. There is one question that to Summer that says the one question from Yuri. Uh, Yuri says, Summer, your work is phenomenal and so captivating or uh, evokes so many emotions as it is so truthful. What message would you I uh, want to send to all women in photojournalism and the ones that are afraid to dive in as they would be afraid to do so. Would, would you want Summer to answer that question? Because I find I saw it in the Q&A sure. space. Sure, absolutely. I will ask, and, yeah, as brief as possible because we're waiting to let the other panelists in. Okay, thank, thank you. That be her final thoughts. Thank you very much. الآن في سؤال سمر بقول إنه عملك رائع جدا وهذا العمل خلاب جدا بحيث إنه بيثير كثير من المشاعر لأنه يتسم بالحقيقة أي رسالة ممكن أن توجهيها لكل النساء العاملة في التصوير الصحفي والنساء التي تخاف من أن تغوص في هذا الأمر لأنهن خائفات من أن يقمن بهذا الأمر. 
الموضوع مش كثير سهل يعني the issue is not a piece of cake uh, to be honest with you you should the woman here said هذا المجال او تحب مجال التصوير بشكل عام I should love this specific area of work which is the photojournalism and should love it from the, the bottom of her heart to be able to do that in general she should expect to be facing every, everything okay and I hope that there would be much more female photojournalists because we as women we see things from a different angle we angel, we see things we arrive reach to people houses and to people hearts also in a faster manner بالبداية أنا مثلا عندي كانت إنه يعني كانت حرب تقريبا علي من المصورين يعني ما بدهم يشوفوني بينهم In the very early days I started this thing I was literally facing a war from other female journalists, photojournalists because they didn't want to see me as one of them they didn't want to see me amongst them كمان كمان الناس العاديين كانوا يعني And also الناس في غزة كثير صعبة The ordinary people the public mindset in Gaza is extremely conservative and difficult بس انا هذا الشيء كان يعزز عندي انه انا اضل مستمره اكثر يعني كنت اعاند اكثر اني انا اضل مستمره مش اوقف لاني متاكده انه عندي رساله اتصل غير عن الرجل اللي يوصلها يعني انا مثلا بقدر اعرف قصص النساء وكيف بيعيشوا في غزه اكثر من الشاب المصور وهذا اللي انا بنصح فيه اي مصوره يعني انه يخوضوا هذا المجال بدون خوف بدون تردد لانه انا متاكده انه هم بيقدروا يصنعوا صوره وقصص بتختلف كليا عن اي حدا ممكن And then all the things that I have been facing rendered me even more insisting and more stubborn to continue doing what I started because the things that I see, the way I perceive things is different than my female colleagues and that made me also insist to go on and proceed with that attempt to deliver the message because the things that I'm delivering are different and my ability also to gain the trust of women and also to get to their hearts was different than the men's and the women, and that's why I am making the recommendation for all the women who want to start this, is to get rid of the fear and to continue to till and to persist till they achieve what they want to achieve. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Joshua. We, sure. Thank you so much, Samar. We can continue this conversation yeah. for hours. I can talk to you for days on the, the work that you guys are doing, just so important. Uh, you know, we'll take this conversation offline, guys. Please follow Summer. Please follow Joshua on Instagram, on Twitter. Their work's amazing. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can bring them on to talk about their work on a different panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Zara. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Zara, would you like to invite in your next panelist? And I can absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, that in this panel, I actually have my niece, Aliza Virgi, who's going to be moderating with me. And uh, I'm going to quickly read her bio so uh, you get to know who she is as well. Just a minute. Uh... So Alisa is a rising junior at the Wheatley School who is extremely passionate about social justice and political movements. Her goal is to make as much impact as possible in the future by learning more about the community and society surrounding her. Alisa is 20, soon turning 16. Uh, our two panelists, Vanessa and Jamie, are 23 and 19 years old. And I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to learning from them. And I'm going to let Alisa introduce both of our panelists. Okay, so first up we have Vanessa, who's 24, and she's a climate activist from Uganda and is the founder of the Africa-based Rise Up movement. So she began striking for the climate in her hometown of Kampala in January 2019 after witnessing droughts and flooding devastating communities in Uganda. So she now campaigns internationally to highlight the impacts of climate change already playing out in Africa, as well as promoting key climate solutions such as educating girls. In 2020, Vanessa was named a UN Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as being listed one of BBC's 100 Women of the Year and the 100 Most Influential Young Africans. Mm -hmm. And then we have Jamie, 
So next up we have Jamie, who is a 19 year old Jewish Colombian American organizer, activist, author, public speaker and filmmaker. She's co-founder of the international youth climate justice movement called Zero Hour that led the official youth climate marches in Washington DC and 25 plus cities around the world during the summer of 2018. Zero Hour has over 200 plus chapters worldwide and has been a leading organization in the climate movement. Jamie's the author of a book called Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It, which has been translated in many languages and sold all over the world. The book serves as a guide to organizing and activism, and she's also a plaintiff on the Our Children Trust Youth v. Gov Washington state lawsuit, AGIP versus State of Washington, suing the state of Washington for denying her generation their constitutional rights to a livable environment by worsening the climate crisis. Jamie served as a surrogate for the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign, speaking at several campaign rallies, um, including the 2020 Tacoma Dome rally to an audience of over 17,000 people filming campaign endorsement videos and doing outreach to get the vote out for Bernie Sanders. She was also one of the youngest delegates at the 2020 Democratic Convention, and she is also one of the young, uh, youngest delegates at the, oh, and she's also a director, screenwriter, and lead actress in a new web series called Art Majors, which is a show about friend groups of LGBTQ plus art students struggling with queer love and breaking into the entertainment industry. She's also the host of Lavender You, a podcast and online community talking about the queer arts and media representation. Jamie is one of Teen Vogue's 21 Under 21 Girls Changing the World in 2018, one of People Magazine's 25 Women Changing the World in 2018, Fuse TV's Latina Trailblazer of 2018, one of the Today Show's 18 Under 18 Groundbreakers of 2019, MTV EMA Generation Change winner of 2019, one of the BBC's most influ 100 influential women of 2019, and one of GLAAD's 20 Under 20 LGBTQ plus people changing the world. She's also on the Out 100 list of 2020. Jamie and Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be talking with you and I'm so excited. I have Aliza who's here and will be helping moderate the panels. Sorry for running over a little bit, but I'm gonna ask you guys to maybe start with your presentation so we can get into the discussions. Uh, Vanessa, if you'd like to go first, that'd be great. Great, um, thank Jamie, you so much. I'll ask you to turn off your video and mute yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. I have no idea how long I should speak for. Can you guide me on that? Sure. I mean, you can speak, you know, for five to seven minutes. Uh, you can go up to 10 minutes. You know, the shorter your presentation, the longer we'll have for our panel discussion. But I do want the people who are present here to get to know you, get to know the amazing work that you're doing. Great. Thank you so much. So hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with all of you today. My name is Vanessa Nakate and I am a climate justice activist with the Fridays for Future movement and also the founder of Rise Up Movement and an online platform, the One Million Activist Stories. And I'm from Kampala, the capital of a country that has one of the fastest changing climates in the world. My activism journey started in 2019 in January when I stepped out to do my very first climate strike after realizing and seeing how much the climate crisis was affecting the people in my country, the people across the world. I realized that the climate crisis was a present, you know, a present crisis and something that was coming in the future. Because I remember in school, I remember studying about it in geography and, you know, it was more of something that we don't really have to worry about, something that would come in the far future that we shouldn't, you know, think about right now. And, when I did my research, I, I was surprised to find that it was a present experience of very many people in my country. And it was because of this that I decided to add my voice to the climate movement and start striking and demanding for climate justice. In my country, Uganda, climate change is evident in very many ways with the rising global temperatures, 
the weather patterns are changing and we are receiving shorter and heavier rainy seasons and more intense dry seasons in some parts of the country. I will give examples of the western part of the country in areas in Kasese. We've experienced extreme flooding because of heavy rainfall causing river banks to burst and uh, leading to massive destruction of people's homes, people's farms, people's businesses, and even loss of lives. And we've seen the same experiences in, um, in the eastern part of the country, areas of Bududa, Bundibujo, that have experienced extreme rainfall as well in the shortest time possible causing massive, you know, massive destruction again of homes, uh, leaving people homeless, uh, leading to the death of some people, leaving people without access to food because their farms are destroyed as a result of the flooding and the landslides. And then when you go to the northern part of the country, suffering with extreme droughts leading to water scarcity because uh, the, the droughts are drying up water sources and leading to food scarcity because the droughts are drying up crops in the gardens and leaving people with nothing. We also saw the water levels of Lake Victoria rise last year. And this was during the pandemic when people had to stay at home and keep themselves safe. But at a time of a pandemic, there was another crisis and the water encroached people's homes. Again, leaving many homeless, leaving many uh, exposed to diseases, especially children, diseases like cholera, diarrhea, because when the water levels rose, they didn't just encroach homes and destroy farms, but they also submerged toilets. So contaminating water sources and leaving people with no access to clean water for drinking or clean water for home use. So these are the things that I have seen happening in my country because of climate change. These are the things that made me become an activist because I realized that uh, the climate crisis was not something that was coming in the future like I thought, and I, I, I got to understand that it was happening right now. Lives were being impacted right now. Lives were being destroyed right now. And in that research, I also went ahead to you know, read about how the climate crisis specifically affects the African continent. And historically, the continent of Africa is responsible for only 3% of global emissions and yet Africans are already suffering some of the most brutal impacts fueled by the climate crisis. From the rapidly intensifying hurricanes, devastating floods and withering droughts and many Africans have lost their lives while countless more have lost their homes, their farms and businesses. And because of the floods, because of the droughts, because of the hurricanes, yeah, people have been left with nothing. They've been left with pain, they've been left with agony, they've been left with suffering, with starvation and death. Because of the climate crisis, we are watching farms collapse. We are watching livelihoods lost. And this is what you know, makes me realize that climate change is more than weather. Climate change is more than statistics. It is about the people because it's impacting people's livelihoods right now. It goes beyond the statistics of these disasters. Individuals, families are impacted when these disasters occur. Families are pushed into extreme poverty because of these disasters. Many children, many uh, families are left with nothing to eat because of climate disasters. Many girls are forced to drop out of school because their families cannot take care of them anymore as a result of, of you know, climate change destroying everything. 
So this is something that inter, interlinks with every sector of our lives. And if we do not address the issue of climate change, then that means we won't have a happy people and we won't have a happy planet. And again, this is why we speak up as, you know, as youth activists. I remember um, before I, I started activism, I did a number of, you know, speeches about different activists. And, you know, it's amazing to see the work of, you know, incredible activists like Jamie, I read about the work of Jamie and the climate march in 2018. And I was really, it made me so happy to see that there are young people out there who are speaking up. And however much it was a very difficult, you know, decision for me being quite shy naturally and fearing to face people while growing up and preferring to be mostly, um, in my own world, if I should say it that way, it was scary to go on the streets. But when I saw um, young people across the world, like Jamie Greta and many more who had already started doing this activism, it was really an inspiration for me. And it gave me the the positivity or the energy or the strength I needed to start striking. And a lot has happened um, since 2019. And now a lot has really happened with the climate movement in Uganda. It has grown more young people are speaking up. More students are educated about the climate crisis and what is happening. Different projects are going on. For example, the, the Rise Up Movement project of installing solar panels and eco-friendly stoves in schools. And we've done this in, um, I think, more than 10 schools now. And this, these are the things that show that, you know, it's those little actions that are going to you know, transform our world and make it a better place. So basically that has been my journey of activism and how I started and why I started and what I really want. I, I want leaders to understand that we are in a climate emergency and leaders need to rise up for the people and the planet right now because communities are facing the impacts of climate change right now. It's not something that is coming to the, in the future. And leaders must also understand that we cannot eat coal and we cannot drink oil. There is no future in the fossil fuel industry. All we want is a future that is clean. All we want is a future that is healthy. All we want is a future that is sustainable and equitable for all of us. And again, climate justice will only be justice if the people from the most affected areas are listened to, are platformed, are amplified and are included. And again, it will only be justice if everyone is included, you know, if everyone is included, if targets or actions are being set, but then they don't put into consideration those who are suffering right now, then that is not climate justice. So I'm really looking forward to listening to Jamie and also for the discussion later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was incredible. I think I could hear you talk for hours on end, uh, but I'm gonna bring in Jamie now to do a presentation so we can get into the discussion. Yeah, well, it's always so lovely to hear Vanessa speak. Um, I think we've both been admiring each other's activism from afar for a while. Both of us live so far away um, that we, we haven't been able to, to meet in person, but I'm, I'm really hoping for the day when, when Vanessa and I finally get to meet because, you know, I've been following her ever since I heard of the great work that she's done. And I know that she's been following me for a while. So I just, you know, that's a part of being a part of the, the climate movement. It's such a great global movement that you have 
friends and, and sisters and allies like all over the world. And, and in one way that's amazing because it's like, I have a friend so far away from, from me where I live and I know that I have family around the world like that. But on the other hand, it, it is kind of sad that we don't get to see each other because we're separated by so many miles. Um, but I am hoping that there will come the day very soon, especially as vaccines are more and more readily available, that Vanessa and I will finally get to meet. And um, with your permission, Vanessa, I would love to give you a big hug the moment that we finally are able to meet in person. Um, but hello everyone, my name is Jamie Sarai Margolin. I'm a 19 year old climate justice organizer, um, author and filmmaker. Um, I'm from a lot of places are, are home to me. I come from a very mixed background uh, and that, that plays a huge part of what I care about, how I'm affected by the climate crisis and, and who I fight for. Um, so I was born in Los Angeles, California. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, which is where I currently am visiting my family, and I study and currently mostly live in New York City. But my family is from, immigrated from um, Colombia, South America, and so I have home as many places for me. On my mom's side, I'm Colombian. Um, I got the, the bracelets representing, and on my dad's side, I am Jewish, um, Ashkenazi Jewish. So I come from the Jewish diaspora, the Latinx diaspora, um, I'm just, I guess, globalism in a person. Um, and seeing all the places that I love deteriorate by the climate crisis has been truly heartbreaking. In Seattle yesterday, we had record-breaking temperatures higher than I think ever recorded in history in this area period. Seattle is very up north. We're right up with the border in, in Canada. None of our houses, hardly any of our houses have air conditioning because we don't need it. We're mostly, it's cold up here. Um, and yet yesterday, myself and my family were absolutely sweltering in the heat, um, just trying to, to make it through, like, I think it got up to like 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is absolutely unheard of for the Pacific Northwest. And people might be like, oh, whatever, that's just a little heat. It's just a little hot out, whatever, get used to it. It gets hot like that all the time in Vegas or California, but it's not natural for it to be this hot, this up North. Our wildlife is not prepared for this kind of heat. Our people are not prepared for this kind of heat. Um, hospitals, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of people with, with heat related issues. And the climate crisis is truly about whether it's not just, oh, it's hotter outside or, or weather is, is worse here or there. It's places that shouldn't be hot are getting very hot. In Canada, it was a sweltering, I think 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Absolutely unheard of that up north. Um, and it's record breaking temperatures over and over again. And it's not just oh, it's hot outside. These are deadly temperatures, especially for regions that are not prepared to handle this, that shouldn't be prepared to handle this for wildlife that is not built to survive in such hot climates. Um, people die of heat stroke. People, this is also why when we talk about climate change being an intersectional issue, those who are homeless, who can't afford air conditioning or, or don't have health care or all sorts of different resources that they need to stay safe when extreme heat hits, but also when extreme cold hits, right? So it was extremely, and it is currently, and the window's open and I'm just trying to like, um, it's extremely, extremely hot up north where it's not supposed to be. Down south in Texas, there was a polar vortex that also was deadly because it was absolutely freezing where it's not supposed to be freezing. And so climate change isn't just about, oh, it's hot outside. It's about different, it's, it's a complete on balance and decalibration of our weather system, of our climate. And that deeply impacts communities, that kills people, that hurts people, that hurts the way we get our food. It intersects with all sorts of different issues. And a lot of people often ask me and, and other people that I work with like, we, okay, you're a climate activist. Why do you also talk about immigration rights? Why do you talk about racial justice? And people need to understand that these issues are interconnected. For example, um, when we talk about immigrant rights, workers' rights, there are people in California, the wor where, where most of the United States gets our food is from the farm workers in, in California who, who are picking our vegetables. And a lot of them are, are immigrants and, and poor communities like who, who are the ones who are picking 
our food and putting food on the table in sweltering heat, not being paid enough in dangerous conditions, and often not having access to healthcare because the United States is the only, and I use developed lightly because that's a very, I don't like that term, that's a colonial term of what's developed and what isn't, but it's the only developed country without healthcare for all system, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so we can see how the fight for Medicare for all, how the fight for immigrant rights, how the fight for higher wages, the minimum wage in the United States needs to be raised. It's absolutely ridiculous and not high enough. All of these things interconnect and the climate crisis gets, as the climate crisis gets worse, all of the issues that we're also combating get worse. Um, I read this article about how higher temperatures actually make people irritable and more violent in, in the sense of like when, when, when there's heat waves, there's also, they're also linked to rises in, um, in, in violence. And I think the, one of the things that, that scares me most about the climate crisis is not just simply what nature or the environment does to, to us in terms of the, us being exposed to worse and worse elements, but also what people do to each other in times of desperation, as it gets hotter and hotter, as resources run out, um, as, as water depletes, as, as resources deplete, as everything happens, people get desperate. And that's how a lot of wars, conflicts break out. There has already been a, a rise of violence in, in all sorts of places all over the world, which is directly linked to the climate crisis, because when there is desperation, when there is lack of, and that's what scares me, you know, you never see autocracies or violent situations right, hardly um, rise out of situations where everyone's happy and peaceful and, and vibrant and um, and everyone has what they need. Oftentimes violence, conflict, um, autocracy, all of these things, they break out when there's desperation, when there is not enough um, and climate change causes this more and more. And so I'm, there are all sorts of scientific articles that are linking violence, uh, increases in violence in different conflicts all over the world with lacks of resources. And so that's just a little bit about, I guess, the, the main things that I'm concerned about regarding the climate crisis and how it is an intersectional issue. And we're feeling the effects right now, you know, I'm trying to recover from the heat wave. And then I'm also anxiously looking at the calendar of like, okay, wildfire season's about to start. Now, Seattle didn't used to have a wildfire season, because again, this up north, we're typically like these Seattle is, is a city built in a temperate rainforest. We're technically a rainforest. That's why it's a sea. It's a, oh, Seattle rains all the time. We're, we're in a rainforest, basically. And suddenly, uh, starting in, I, I actually remember my first wildfire season because it's not natural, this up north. Um, it was summer of 2017. That was actually what spurred me to start Zero Hour. Um, was seeing my city covered in a thick layer of smog. Now, something to know about the Pacific Northwest is that we are known for like crisp, clean air. Like you step outside and there's so many trees. We have evergreen trees. Um, we're called, Washington is considered the Emerald State and Seattle is often referred to as the Emerald City, considering that it's always green all year round because the trees, most of our trees don't shed leaves. They're, they're, they're evergreen and you step outside and it rains a lot too. And so you step outside and you can just, you smell the trees, you smell the, even in the city, like I don't live in the out far. I live like very close to down to, to, to like in, in the city. And it's, this isn't like in the outskirts, like in the actual city of Seattle, usually the air is very fresh and clean, hardly any smog, crisp, cool greenery. The ocean is right in front of you. Um, and okay. Yeah. I'll finish this up. The ocean is right in front of you. And so it was so devastating to see the, um, the wildfires completely blow a thick layer of smog over our city. It was almost absolutely apocalyptic. Um, it hurt to breathe. It gave me migraines, um, breathing in the air hurt because of the wildfires that were blowing over our city because of climate change. And ever since 2017, which is the first time that I've ever seen that happening. And I've lived in Seattle from when I was two to when I was 18. So I would have remembered if it had happened before. Um, I, it's now every summer is, it's instead of looking forward to the summer, it's almost like we start dreading wildfire season and getting ready for the smog and the 
the and and for it to hurt to breathe and that is honestly that's what sparked me to start zero hour and i'm going to stop now so that we have time for questions and i realize i've been talking for a while but it's just really rough because summer used to be something that i really used to look forward to and now in the pacific northwest summer is when we brace ourselves for unnatural heat waves and wildfire seasons where it hurts to breathe and a lot of people go to the emergency room for all sorts of respiratory issues Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you for that personal and wonderful presentation. Vanessa, I'm going to invite you back into the conversation as well, if you can turn on your video and unmute yourself. Thank you, ladies. Uh, the, I, you know, the reason I invited you guys to this conversation that is hosted by Magnum, which is about photography, is because to me, what I find really interesting about the climate movement and what I find interesting about the work young activists are doing is that so much of your activism is also about recording yourselves. It is about taking videos, taking images of the work that you're doing about the activism and posting it onto your social accounts. And when you compare that to different movements that have happened in the past, whether it was the movement for LGBTQ rights, whether it was the women's movement, a lot of the activism involved people documenting what was happening. Of course, there was a lot of self-documentation in that as well, but it was a lot of, you know, we're showing pictures of what's happening in that movement space. Whereas with you guys, it is you taking a video, selfie images, you know, whatever it is, posting it straight to your Instagram account, straight to your Twitter, to your TikTok. And that is part of so much of the awareness raising that you guys are doing. Um, and, and so that's the conversation I'd like to have so that we as older people can be inspired by the work you're doing and we can learn about, you know, how we do that storytelling, how we build narratives around issues. Um, Alisa has a question you want to go ahead yeah. and ask? Firstly, yeah. I just want to say thank you for both of your amazing presentations. I've learned so much already about this prominent issue because I'm always trying to educate myself more. So my first question is for Vanessa. So you were one of the most um, famous people in Africa and the world, and you've obviously had a lot of personal experiences with social media. So do you think that social media for activism can really help the climate movement? Or do you think it's kind of just become a performative act of likes and comments and those kinds of issues? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I can speak from a personal experience. Social media has really been very helpful for me as an activist, because when I did my very first climate strike, I, I shared it on Twitter and many people were so supportive and sending encouraging messages that really motivated me to keep doing the strikes, however uh, however much it was so difficult. So I think social media is really a good tool, um, a good tool for, for activism. Um, well, I can give examples, especially in this pandemic, it has really helped us a lot in continuing with our activism, even while doing it from home because we couldn't go to the streets anymore. And we were able to, to reach many people. Actually, if it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't be speaking with you today. If it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't be knowing Jamie as well and many other incredible young activists across the world. So it has been a good place of communicating the crisis of communicating the challenges and organizing and collaborating with fellow activists across the world. Thank you. Okay, so my next question is for Jamie, but it goes for Vanessa as well, if you'd like to answer. So obviously being an activist for all these different movements like LGBTQ plus and women's rights and climate changes, um, have you faced any negative comments or harassment because of being a public figure who is so passionate about these things? And if so, has it ever changed your motivation to work for these goals? All the time, constantly 24 um, seven. It's difficult just being a Jewish woman on the internet. It's difficult being an openly lesbian woman on the internet. Um, and just being a woman on the internet, I get creepy messages from men all the time. I get men who are like, I can turn you straight, like all sorts of stuff like that. I get like, like threats sometimes. Um, one time it was really scary because, I mean, I usually just ignore these. I just kind of screenshot them and laugh and send them to my friends. Like, look, he spelled lesbian wrong or like something. That they're like, is you lesbian? Like, they'll be kind of funny, honestly, or they're sometimes they're very like sexually inappropriate comments that I have to block and delete. Um, 
but you know there was this one time where a bunch of nazis found out that i was jewish which is like big surprise it's not a secret like okay cool and a, a bunch of nazi bots and trolls found it and they were just you know they were editing like all sorts of different stereotypes like they edited like my nose bigger i'm like okay we get it like i have a great you know all these stereotypes all these like you know the whole stereotypes of like jews and money jews and conspiracy of taking over the world we have big noses yada yada whatever and they were like editing pictures of me with swastikas on it I, there was this one picture where they were editing like my arms into swastikas and posting them and like saying like i mean i get messages that are kind of like oh like people will message like hitler missed a jew or like hitler missed one or something like that um and most of these i just kind of block delete block delete but one of them was like, you know, we're going to find your synagogue and something like that. And that was the one that got me because hate crimes against Jewish people are on the rise and synagogues often get vandalized with like swastikas, um, Nazi symbolism, other things like that. Uh, just just pe people are getting attacked. And so I was very apprehensive and I kind of took a bit of a Twitter break after that, um, after that happened. And, and it's just kind of a consistent stream of like, you know, disapproval from all sides. And you just have to learn to, to, I mean, it, it can kind of make you, it's, I've never once wanted to give up. Like these, these things have never once made me want to give up fighting, but they definitely have made me have a very complex relationship with social media where I agree with Vanessa like I wouldn't have known about Vanessa if it weren't for social media we wouldn't have met if it weren't for social media we've never met in person but I still consider her my friend because we can talk online we share each other we amplify each other's causes we sometimes talk on whatsapp you know and so we have like like social media is a way to make friends it's a way to expand the movement but it also can open you up to dangerous people it can open you up to harassment and these people people feel braver to, to say nasty things to you or to threaten you um, on the internet in a way that they are not as, you, you know, like, I mean, some people might say that to my face other than like, I don't know, cat colors on the street. No one has really had the courage to, to say any of these things to my face because people typically don't do that. But with the internet, you can anonymously hide behind whatever. And verbally abuse someone and there's no limit to that and so that's definitely like the downside but I've developed a pretty thick skin so now I just kind of block the comments and you know move on yeah. Vanessa I'm really interested in sort of like you know the activism that you do and you know the impact of images and videos and how does that how does that take place in the context of East Africa, in Africa, you know, we're US based, a lot of the audience is from North America, but I want, I want to, I, we want to learn more about what does that space look like uh, in your part of the world? Um, like using pictures for social media? Yeah, yeah, pictures, videos, you know, selfie videos, like, is that something that young people in the African continent are, are, are doing more vibrantly than in other parts of the world? Like, how is that different? What's unique about that space? Well, um, many young people here use a lot of pictures and videos, TikToks for social media, but few of them usually use it for activism. So it's just mainly having fun and yeah. Uh, but for those I've seen who use it for social media, pictures and videos I've mainly seen on Twitter. Um, very many young people here, activists are using Twitter to talk about the climate issues in their communities and also to talk about some of the actions that they are doing in their communities and also um, some of the projects they are running. Uh, if I'm to again give the example of the Green School project of the solar panels and eco-friendly stocks, usually when an installation is taking place, um, we do like lives of um, the installation. It takes like three days. So we do like lives of the installation when it starts and just share the whole journey up to the end. And we do this basically for people to it's more of for transparency and people to see how their donations are helping out the project and helping to you know, put these eco-friendly stoves and solar panels 
in communities and schools across Uganda. So I have seen young people use social media for activism, including myself, but then the largest number uses it for fun and yeah, making so many funny TikToks. Um, I have a follow-up question for you. So uh, why do you think that educating the youth is such a crucial step towards finding an environmental solution? Yeah, um, I think education really helps um, and empowers many young people to speak up. Like I said, in school, I remember the issue and the topics of climate. When we would study about that in geography, it was more of the theory of it and you study and you do your exam and then you pass. So we didn't really, we weren't really told that it was a reality of what was happening. So I think educating young people about the realities that are happening right now, the injustices that are happening across the world, and also educating them how they can use their voices and their platforms to address these issues is very helpful because education helps equip them with some of the tools that they need because if it wasn't for education still, I wouldn't have done the research. I wouldn't know how to do the research. I wouldn't know how to read those articles. I wouldn't know how to you know, connect everything along the way and understand all these intersections of climate change. So I think it's important to educate uh, young people starting from schools and having um, that the, the school curriculums have climate change as, you know, an, a tool for people to learn, for young, for young people to learn. And also not just young people, because there are also people in the communities, uh, the adults who are not in school, who may not even understand uh, the language of 1.5 degrees. So it's also important to educate them in the language that they understand. And we've done that in the Rise Up, where we've gone to communities and you know spoken to families, individuals about why their crops are drying up, about why the rainfall is too much, because they will understand climate change if you bring it in the language of, it's going to affect the food that you eat, it's going to affect the water that you drink. So I believe education is really a powerful tool, not just for the young people, but also for the, for the adults in those communities, but not just education, but also language matters. Again, no one will understand the science of climate change, but then you can bring it in the most, you know. I think we've, the, Vanessa's video has frozen. <laughs> we have you back here. Vanessa. Oh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. You froze for a few seconds. Oh, where did I freeze? You, drop, you dropped off at the importance of language. The language matters. Oh. Yeah, um, education is really important, but also language matters. This, the education you will give um, young people in school, uh, maybe in primary school, we call it primary school here. I don't know if it's middle school in other countries, but the education that you give students in primary school will differ from what you teach students in secondary school and students at university. And again, it's different from what you're going to teach um, adults in rural communities who, ha who haven't had access to education. So I think education is really important and also empowerment of girls and young women as we see the climate movement is clearly led by very many incredible young girls and young women who are demanding for climate justice. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, Jamie, for you, I had a question. You have your own podcast. You know, you have, uh, you're on TikTok. You post a lot of videos there. You're on Instagram. You are on Twitter. All of your platforms have massive followings. What is the importance of self-documentation for you? Why do you think that you need to tell your own story and the story of your work on your platforms? If I don't control the narrative, then, then, then the narrative about me and about my work and about the stories that I tell, they just get skewed. And I think it's important to share, like, I mean, there are billions of people in this world. And if you don't speak up and, and make your own voice heard, no one's going to make it heard for you. No one's going to hold the camera to you and be like, 
tell tell me what you think speak up you have to be proactive in that and look sometimes mostly i use social media for work amplifying um climate climate causes uh things that i care about projects that i've worked on things that i've written films that i've made etc but sometimes i also use it for fun and i think there's also that aspect of expressing yourself and expressing your personality online it's a great way to find community it's a great way to meet people also like um usually like on instagram and twitter i'm pretty mostly serious and there are a lot of people driving around okay um sorry if you can hear all the sirens um like on Instagram and Twitter, you know, I'm very like, you know, focused on climate and, and film and LGBTQ rights. And then, you know, sometimes on TikTok, I'll just post a funny little joke or just comment about something. And then I'll also post about like, I posted yesterday about my experience with the, the heat wave and not having air conditioning and things like that. Um, I honestly think that self-documentation is important, but it's also important to find a balance that it doesn't veer into the the ego side of things i feel that with like influencer culture and social media culture and like you know me 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 culture it's very easy to get caught up kind of i i guess i would i would advise people not to get caught up in the whole likes and followers and i need to post absolutely everything i do like yes i do post a lot but a lot of the work that i do like a lot of the meetings that i do activism that i do it doesn't go up on my instagram or twitter or TikTok or facebook which i hardly use but is there um and you don't have to, like, I feel like there's also this pressure that people feel that's like, I have to record everything. I have to put it all out there. Otherwise it doesn't exist. And I, I advise people against that. Post what you want. Like I just post what I feel like is the highlights of some of the work that I've done or something that I'm proud of or an accomplishment or a message that I'm just dying to get across. But I, I don't, I'm working on like, you know, getting away from the pressure of like, making everything and everything public and also remembering when to step back and not just like call attention to yourself because social media can also be a place where it there's is a lot of clout chasing a lot of fakeness and so there's a lot to navigate but i would just encourage people listening out there who are activists or who do other work or um and who feel you know social media also i'm someone who struggles with chronic anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder and social media like gives me a lot of anxiety like when i go on these apps i do it because i not because I have to, no one's like making me and I, I do partially enjoy them, but I do, it doesn't, I do get overstimulated and it does really increase my anxiety and make me compare myself to others, all of these things like that. So I think for, for mental health, I often take social media breaks. I often um, set timers, like on my phone, you can set a social media timer that's like, okay, only 20 minutes today. Um, and setting boundaries with the internet you don't have to over people nowadays i feel like overshare so much on the internet you don't have to share and tell everything you don't have to post everything and you can take breaks is really also the advice that i would give because it can be mentally draining and overstimulating and i can sometimes end up doom scrolling like you know you go on twitter and it's like this person's dying this person was bombed this t tragedy happened this tragedy happened and you feel powerless and you're like oh my god and sometimes it's okay to just shut it off and like watch a movie and that's what i end up doing and that's okay so people should also have balance when it comes to the internet so i have one last question for both of you so this can go in with your final thoughts if you want to share so how is advocating for movements involving climate change created a unified community of people who are determined for change as well, because you guys were both talking about how you connected through social media and you've met so many influential figures and so many new people. So how has it created this unified community? Jamie, if you wanna go first and then Vanessa. Oh, okay. I think it's made the world smaller in a good way. Um, Vanessa and I are thousands and thousands of miles away, but with social media, I can see the work that she's doing. I can go on Twitter and be like, oh, I wonder what, like, what causes Vanessa's, like, advocating for today, and I can, like, retweet and be like, oh, go support this or, or see what's happening and vice versa with her. And so I feel like it has made us all more interconnected. We can be in group chats. We can talk to each other. The, the world becomes, the globe becomes smaller because, in a good way, because uh, we're able to bridge the the thousands of miles to to unite around the same thing that we're fighting for, even though her community is impacted by the climate crisis differently than mine, even though, um, you know, the, the region of the world that she's from has a different like environment and climate than the Northwest, we're still in it together. And social media kind of, and, and the ability to communicate kind of reminds us that we're in it together. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. I think 
you've literally said what I would say. Like, yeah. it has created, like, it has made organizing much easier for all of us. And it has been a place of supporting each other, inspiring each other, motivating each other, and amplifying each other. And it's also when I know that um, if I need rest today, I know that Jamie's out there speaking. If Jamie needs rest, she knows that I'm here speaking. So it has really created that form of like a family knowing that we are all here for each other and we have the same vision of the kind of future that we want. So it has been a good place for activism. Thank you so much, guys. I can't tell you how how fun this conversation was, how much we've enjoyed it. Do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I never really knew much about climate change before this, but you guys have taught me so much and I'm really excited to keep learning and continue this conversation. Yeah, and I definitely wanted her to be on because I know you guys are an inspiration for people like me, people who are older than me, but I think y'all are really, really amazing role models for also the younger generation. So thank you so much for all the work you do and for amplifying people's voices and sharing your voices. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. So we, we were here, we were listening um, in the back and it was incredibly interesting to hear you all and um, talk about your fights and the way you, you you know, you do it and we'll follow you and hopefully work with you at some point too. It's important. We're, we're already talking about a collaboration. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. We're talking about and, collaborations and I think there's something there where, yeah, photography. Yeah, and follow Vanessa and Jamie on Instagram, on Twitter. If you have, have TikToks, the TikToks are amazing. You know, follow them there as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put my you. tags in the chat and maybe Vanessa, you can put your tags in the chat so people know where to follow you. That would be brilliant. Thank you so much. That was incredibly inspiring. And uh, and and thank you so much, Sarah, for what an incredible um, session. And, uh, you know, again, a, a huge thank you um, to Joshua and Samar and Akram uh, and to Jamie and uh, Eliza, Eliza, Eliza and Vanessa. It was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everyone. Thank Have a wonderful you. day or night or Thank wherever you it is in your time Excuse zone. Me. Bye. Thank you, Ren. Oh, and just to say also, back here in two hours. Well, no, a little, <laughs> little more than two hours. Um, right. Bye, everyone. For our next session. Thank you so much.